nigh unto God. God will draw nigh unto us. And as we approach thee, Lord, we do so on the ground of redemption. We thank thee for that redeeming work of Calvary. We thank thee for the blood of the lamb that was shed for the sheep of God's pasture. And we rejoice tonight that amongst that innumerable number that we have been counted in, and we pray that you'll accept of our thanks tonight for that precious blood that still speaks better things than that of Abel. And Lord, we come tonight and we would plead for our gathering. We pray, Lord, that thou will protect us from the enemy without. We know the word of God tells us of those foul spirits of the air that the devil sends to snatch away the good seed of God's precious word. We pray for their defeat tonight. We pray that thou will bind the strong man and Lord, that thou wouldst enable us by the spirit of God to go in and to spoil his goods. We ask this evening that thou wouldst not only defeat the enemy without, but defeat the enemy within. Lord, we realize that even in the hearts of those who gather uh, for the worship of God and to hear the word of God, there are those who on that great day, if it was to be called today, would be garnered as tares rather than wheat. And we pray for the preparation of the heart of the Spirit of God in lives tonight. Even before we open the book of God tonight, we pray that thou the Spirit of God will lay hold of individuals and will speak to them. Open their minds, dear Lord. Open their hearts. Prepare them for what God has to say to them this evening. And Lord, even in measure we ask of thee, I pray that thou wilt uh, use this gathering and use this word tonight to bring them that final step of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you'll bless your servant tonight as he would sing in song. We ask, Lord, that he might be enabled to sing the new song and uplift his Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that thou wilt lay liberally to him and bless us all as a people. We need the Lord's grace and his presence and his help. We pray for all of our homes and all of our families. We pray that thou wilt unite all of our homes in the Lord Jesus Christ. On that great day, may there be none found amongst the tares, but may they be all gathered in to the garner of God, amongst the wheat of God for all eternity. We pray for this community here in Munnesleyan. O Lord, we ask that thou, by the Spirit of God, will move in it. We thank thee for tokens of good that have been given even in days gone by. And we cry to thee, Lord, that thou wilt add uh, thy grace and thy blessing to what already has been bestowed and that we would see a real move of the Spirit of God in this community. We would ask, dear Father, for all of our sister congregations tonight. I do remember the Reverend Henderson this evening in on a long lay liberally to his hand there and grant unto him the help of the Lord and the enablement of the Spirit of God. And we pray that he'll have the joy at the end of the meeting tonight of leading uh, those long prayed for ones to faith in Jesus Christ. We pray for all of our sister churches tonight. Lord, we, we fear the tide is far out and we cry to thee that thou the Spirit of God will bring that tide of blessing back in again. That God will come to our little province and that God will rescue us from our sin, from our folly and from, Lord, our backslidings and that thou wilt revive us again. We've thought of that verse today already in Psalm 85 and verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Cause us to rejoice, even as we look out and see the hand of God made bare. So bless us now, we wait before thee, and as we wait before thee, give us expectation of heart and life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're pleased to welcome along this evening our brother, Mr. Stephen Patterson, and Stephen's going to come now and sing to us. Well, I'm very glad to be 
among you for your special harvest service. And we pray that it'll not only be a harvest of wheat and grain, but also a harvest of souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. The first piece I'm going to sing, I believe I actually sang a few weeks ago at your mission. So I hope you liked it. I'm going to sing it again. It's entitled, Count Your Blessings. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed When you are discouraged thinking all is lost Count your many blessings, name them one by one And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your blessings, see what God hath done Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your many blessings, see what God hath done are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy, your reward in heaven nor your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you till your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast 
domain and be held in sin's red sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Yes, I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's red sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out of the comb. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain. And be held in sin's red sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Oh yes, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. This world affords today. Let us turn in the Word of God, please, to the Old Testament Scriptures for a Bible reading. <clears throat> We're turning to the book of Psalms. And we're going to turn to Psalm number one. Psalm number one. Psalm one. Let's hear the word of God. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. We'll end this reading here at verse 6. Now at this stage of our meeting, we'll ask our brother, Mr. Sterrett, to come and bring the necessary announcements. Let me welcome you all to our harvest and anniversary services. 
and especially if you're visiting with us, we bid you special welcome in the Saviour's name, and we trust that you will know the Lord's presence among us this evening as we gather together to worship him. We want to give a special welcome to our guest preacher, the Reverend Ian Horace. He's no stranger to many of us, and we welcome again you, Mr. Horace, in the Saviour's name, and we trust that God will bless you tonight as you minister to us from the word of the Lord. We want to give a special welcome again to our special singer, Mr. Stephen Patterson. We welcome Stephen back again among us. He's been with us on occasions before. We have enjoyed his ministry, and especially that second piece to my heart was certainly a blessing. Today, the special offering will be going to the work in Pakistan. Now, Mr. Henderson has uh, remarked on that work in Wednesday night and again today, so I'm not going to say anything about it. <clears throat> they need some finance to finish a school that they're involved in building, and uh, Money Slane want to help them very much in that if we can do that. So give as generously as you can, please, to that work. Next Sunday is the retiring missionary offering. Last Sunday's church maintenance fund offering came to £540, to which we thank you all for your generous giving. Tomorrow night, the services continue, and the special speaker at 8 o'clock is the Reverend Colin Mercer. He's our deputy moderator, and the singer will be Mr. Matthew Simpson. Tuesday night is the Gospel Bus Team at 7 p.m. Continue to remember the team and the children in your prayers, please. Then Wednesday night is our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., and the Reverend Henderson will be continuing his studies in the book of Nehemiah. Friday night, youth night at 8 p.m., Mr. Stephen Crawford will be along to speak to the young people. The subject he has is, How Do I Pray?, Young people, remember that meeting, please. Then on Saturday, the open-air meeting in the square in Rathfriland at 11 a.m. You'll notice it's brought forward a week. It's normally the third week in the month, but it's brought forward to the second Saturday this, this, this month. So do please remember that 11, p 11 a.m. on the square. Service is next Lord's Day, Sabbath School, 10.45 a.m., morning worship at 12 noon with the time of prayer at half past 11 and then the evening gospel service at 7 with the time of prayer at half past 6 and in the will of the Lord the Reverend Henderson will be with us for those meetings. We want to give a special thanks to all those who supplied produce and for those who decorated the church so tastefully and beautifully we want to, we want to give them our thanks at this time. For those who have missionary boxes, it's time to bring, bring those in, please. We would ask you to continue to pray for the sick and for the elderly and shut-ins and those who have suffered bereavement in recent days do continue to pray that God will be their portion. And all these announcements are subject to the will and to the mind of the Lord. <clears throat> Thank our brother uh, for his words of welcome. It's good to be with you in Monsley in this evening to have the opportunity to preach at your harvest weekend and anniversary meetings. We pray the Lord will continue to bless you here. It's my first time on the Lord's Day being with you from all of your renovations and the new church hall being opened, etc. See, COVID changed everything, didn't it? Even how we mix, how we move and who we mix and move with. So it is nice to be here and to just to see what the Lord has done. And we commend you for the vision for the, the generation that's to come. And we pray the Lord will, will bless the witness here and continue to bless it in a wonderful way. I always like to take a little moment when I'm visiting churches on behalf of the mission board, just to thank our people for their generous support and giving. It has been a real challenge over the past year <coughs> with meetings been shut, well, the past year and a half now, with meetings been shut down and, Opportunity so limited even to have missionaries visiting around our churches. And yet, brethren and sisters, I have to tell you, the income of the mission board has gone up. It has not gone down. 
And so we give God the glory for that. That has enabled us to carry on all of the work that we are doing, but also to support other nationals who are doing work, a work that you and I could never do in places that we could never reach and people that will will probably this side of God's eternity never come into contact with. And I'm so delighted uh, to learn of your your vision here, uh, even in Munaslain, to help the, the school in Pakistan. And I commend it to you. I was reading the history of the Sunday school movement over the last few weeks. And of course, it was the Sunday school movement in England that really started the, the poor schools in England because they wanted, Robert Drakes, he wanted that the children who come to the Sunday school on Sunday would know how to read and they would know how to write. And therefore, they would know the word of God and they would be able to understand the, the, the truth of God better. And that's our vision in all of this. Because the children that we are supporting uh, in schools, so the one school that you are uh, supporting is only but one. There's another school that we are supporting, uh, we call it Grace Academy. So this school that you're supporting and have a vision to build for is a way up in, in the tribal remote areas. So we have another school we're supporting in one of the large cities. And uh, it just amazes me. I log on by Zoom. I, I can visit anywhere in the world by Zoom that is internet. And it's just amazing to see all of those children. And I sent out to them the child's catechism. And every one of them has been presented with the child's catechism and has been translated back into Urdu. So the younger ones are doing the child's catechism. The older ones are, are already on the shorter catechism. And it just thrills my heart to think of young boys and girls and young people in Pakistan and they've been taught the catechism, they've been taught the shorter catechism, they're, they've been taught the word of God week, week in, week out. And as I'm sure you are aware, Pakistan on the world watch list, I think is fourth or fifth on the world watch list is one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a Christian. And yet with all, there's, there is a Christian community there. And out of the millions in Pakistan, there is a, a, there's a Christian community and they're carrying on a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And they don't have what you and I have. So if we're able to support them to carry on that witness, well, we, we give the Lord thanks for that. So thank you for your help to those who find it difficult to help themselves. And they're carrying on the work week by week and uh, doing stuff that you and I could only ever imagine uh, could ever happen. I was very thrilled just a few weeks ago to get uh, contacts from people, from Muslim people, asking for the word of God. Now, that's a, that's a rare thing. I'm in on a long 15 plus years, and I've never had anybody phone up the months and say, I want a Bible or the Word of God. So when somebody sends in that clarion call, can you give us the Word of God? We cannot but fail to rise to the occasion. So thank you for your giving. Not just this one scheme, of course, because I know you've been supporting many others. Just thank you for your giving. And on that great day when we stand before the Lord, well, the Lord will know exactly what was given and from what heart and from what pocket and what with, and with what motive and it will all be for his glory and the honour of his great and glorious name. We're going to sing a hymn, just a few verses from it. It's a long hymn, but I think it's <clears throat> one of the greatest probably gospel harvest hymns we have, hymn number 223. We'll sing together verses 1, 3 and 5 and we'll stand together as we sing. And at the conclusion, we'll ask your brother Stephen to bring his final message and song. Hymn number 223, verses 1, 3 and 5. We'll stand to change your position again as we sing.
I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, do you take time each day to give God thanks? We're here at our harvest service and we know that the Lord provides for us daily and it's things that we take for granted so easily. This last piece that I'm going to sing is that of thankfulness. And I urge you to take that upon your heart and to try not to take things for granted but to give God the glory and the thanks that he is deserving of. Turn with me again, please, to your Bible reading in the book of Psalms. And we're looking at Psalm 1, 
And we're going to turn to verse 4, Psalm 1 and verse 4. You're finding your place. Can I thank Stephen for those lovely messages and song? And we pray that the Lord will continue to bless him and uh, enable him to uplift high that precious name of the Saviour in his singing as he's done tonight. Psalm number 1 and verse 4 is our text for this evening. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Now with the word of God open before us, let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's not make it just something of rote or of form, but let us really ask the Lord to minister to all of our hearts tonight as the book of God is opened and as we would meditate upon its truth. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for these lovely messages of song that we've heard this evening. And we do want to thank thee, dear Lord. Thank thee from the depths of our heart for all that the Lord Jesus Christ means to us, has done for us, and yet, Lord, will do for us in eternity to come. We give thee all the praise and all the honour and all the glory and we ask that you'll ever give us a thankful heart. We pray now as we come around the word of God that thou will bless it to our hearts and to our lives. I cry to thee, dear Lord, that thou will send the enablement of God the Holy Spirit and that thou wouldst grant unto me that endowment with power that is from on high. May the fleece not just be wet this night, but may the ground around the fleece be wet. May the dew of heaven fall upon us. And may we know the Lord striving in our midst and speaking to us. I ask this, believing in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the book of Psalms. I, I was brought up in the Presbyterian church. I, I think I was a, born with a love for it. I love to hear these psalms sung. But time and time again, I go back to read them study them and preach from them because the book of Psalms has always occupied a prominent place in the Christian church. Bishop Hooker once said about them, what is there necessary for man to know which the Psalms are not able to teach? And I think that just summarizes the whole thing. Whatever is necessary for you and I to know on the journey of life, the book of Psalms is able to teach us. So going through the subject matter of the Psalms alone reveals the vast range of knowledge that is imparted to us from this wonderful portion of God's Word. We have Psalms that teach us how to praise God. And I think that's very important, how we praise God in His sanctuary. And that's why, I know in Mullis Lane you do, but that is why I love in the worship of God that the Psalter is used and the Psalms are actually sung. And then we're not only taught how to praise God, we're taught how to pray to God. If ever your prayer life becomes really dead and stagnant uh, and you want the Lord to revive your prayer life, just read the prayers of the Psalms because a lot of these Psalms are just the outpourings of the heart of the psalmist in prayer to Almighty God. And of course, if you want to know what pardon and mercy is, read the Psalms. So whatever you need to know, whatever is necessary for you to know on the journey of life, you'll undoubtedly find it in the Psalms. So truly, as old Bishop Hooker put it, there is nothing that is necessary for man to know that the Psalms are not able to teach us. Over the past few years, I've grown to love the writings of John Brown of Haddington from Scotland, uh, one of Scotland's greatest theologians, uh, and of course, one of his famous books is his notes on the metrical Psalms. And he said, the book of Psalms is one of the most extensive and useful in Holy Scripture as it is everywhere suited to the case of the saints. So we just don't use them to sing and to praise God. We use them in our spiritual walk with God. Now, this first Psalm that we've read together this evening it is regarded as the preface, the introduction to the whole of the Psalter itself. It is one of two psalms that are known as the orphan psalms. And they're known as the orphan psalms because they don't have any heading 
of who wrote them. Although the second psalm, which is also included, is, in, is uh, entitled to David in the New Testament. It starts with the word blessed. Blessed. It ends with the word perish. That's a warning note for us here this evening. The opening word blessed introduces us to the happiness of the true believer. It's in the plural in the original language that we're talking about, the blessednesses, the happinesses. Happy, happy, we can say, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. There is nobody should be as happy as the child of God. There is no one should have the song of joy in their heart as the people of God. And if you don't have that joy in your heart and life tonight, well, there's something wrong, my brother or sister, with your relationship with God. Now, we're not always up there in the mountain. I know that. And I've walked many uh, dark valleys. But the Lord, even in the valley, gives you a song in the night and something to praise him for. So at this harvest Thanksgiving, we do return our thanksgiving to God for all of his blessings. It would be remiss not to talk about the temporal blessings, how God has provided for us in such a wonderful manner in this world that we live in, how God has provided for us. I, I've thought of that much over the past year and a half. During lockdown, even up in Annalong, that little village up in the mountain, if I needed anything, I just had to lift the phone down to the shop and it was delivered to my door. Now, could you beat that? Really? Aren't we well provided for in this land that we live in? We have an abundance, an abundance of things that other people only dream about. We are temporarily well provided for. At the harvest, we do stop to give God all the glory and the thanksgiving of our hearts for the temporal blessings of the harvest home. And because we're country people and we live and, and, and mix in the rural areas, then we, we know just the hard labor and the work that goes in to producing all that keeps us going throughout the rest of the year. But all of that pales into insignificance. When we put it beside the eternal spiritual blessings that are ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people tonight and they only live for the blessings that are here and now. They don't know anything of the blessings that are for the hereafter. And here and now, we might at best, if the Lord tarries, give us maybe 70, 80 plus years. But what is it, brethren and sisters? It is absolutely nothing when we put it beside the great long ages of eternity. Tonight, we're not just talking to you about here and now. I want you to focus about the blessings that are from God for the hereafter, for eternity, which is yet to come. This psalm addresses all of those things. It has a simple twofold division. Verse 1 to 3, we have the blessed condition of the godly. And, this for, and then from verse 4 to 6, we have the cursed estate of the godless. So the opening part describes the godly. The closing part describes the godless. The first half is an exposition of the life of the saint. It should be. It should be. And the latter half is an exposure of the doom that awaits the ungodly. And you're either one or the other. Sometimes we, 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 we don't like just to put it as plain and as straightforward as that, but that's exactly how God and his word puts it. You're either numbered amongst the godly or the godless. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You're either on the way to heaven tonight or still on the road to hell and a lost eternity. You're either one or the other. You're either in verse 1 to 3 or verse 4 to 6. I have been particularly struck by the words of verse 4. It conjures up a powerful image, I think, at this harvest season of the year. So, introducing the way of the ungodly, the psalmist, he proceeds to say, the ungodly are not so. Here we have a beacon warning to the unsaved concerning their lifestyles, concerning their choices. It's a life which can never produce eternal happiness. I want to underscore that this evening for you. Whatever happiness, whatever riches it produces here, this side of eternity, it will never produce happiness beyond the grave. Now, what's more important? 
helping us for 50, 60, 70 years here or helping us for all of God's eternity. That's the choice that God is putting before you tonight. It's a way of life that can only end in the curse. In a lost eternity. Verse 6 tells us, where the ungodly shall perish. I I want to stop with you tonight. We're just going to look simply at this great portion of God's word, this opening preface to the whole Psalter itself. And your happiness, both in time and in eternity, depends whether you're in verse 1 to 3 or whether you're in verse 4 to 6. Because with the ungodly, it is not so. Firstly then, we learn of the stark contrast between the godly and the godless. That's what verse 4 really introduces to us. It tells us about the blessed man, verse 1 to 3, and then just so starkly, so abruptly, it says, but the ungodly are not so. It couldn't be any more vivid. Now, I was reminded this morning and on along that there are certain things that men see and there are certain things that only God sees. And as we look out in the meeting, we see just with the physical eye. And so we're all seeing the same thing, but God's looking into the heart. God sees exactly what's going on in your heart and in your life tonight. God sees exactly whether you're in verse 1 to 3 or verse 4 to 6. The blessed man in verse 1 had a separated walk in the world. Look at him. He did not take his counsel from the, from the unbelieving world. We all have to live in this world, brethren and sisters. We have to trade in it. We have to work in it. We have to survive in it. And here is where we make our sojourn, our pilgrimage from here to eternity, which is yet to come. But we must never allow the norms are the standards of this world to be our standards. We must never allow that to happen. The counsel of the godly man is from a higher authority as he seeks to obey the law of God and the commandments of God. Now we know today the commandments of God, sadly, have been set aside in this land that we live in. We see it today in the breakage, the constant breakage of the Sabbath day and of the law of God in our land. And it has become so bold, it has become so brazen. It calls down the judgment of God upon it. But this man... His objective in life was to obey that law. Didn't matter what other people would do. He would obey the law of God. And that's the only way to true happiness in life. It is to walk obediently. When the godly man uh, sees others doing wrong, he he can't stop them doing wrong. But he doesn't have to follow them in their wrongdoing. Nor does he have to encourage them to continue in their sin. Now, think about this contrast. Verse 4 says, the ungodly are not so. So where are the ungodly? Well, they're so at one with the world. They have made their home in this world. This world is their home. This world is all they know. And the world's standards are never questioned. There are very few no's left in this society that we live in. Standards that, as a boy... uh, I was brought up with today have been jettisoned. They've been, they've been thrown out the window. Now that is just in one life, lifespan. What is it not right across the whole of our community? Whether it be the fashions, whether it be the fads uh, of the world that we live in, the ungodly, they're just consumed with it and they just go with it. They just go with it. They never think about it. I, I think that's very evident to us. I was thinking of the protests in America this weekend. What are they protesting about? Well, I suppose in America every weekend the protests. But they're protesting about, they called it reproductive rights. But it's not reproductive rights. It's about ending the right of a child that already has been conceived. That's what it's about. It's about abortion rights. People are marching for abortion. They are marching for death in our land 
tonight. And it's no different in this land of ours. No different. They mightn't be out in the streets, but there's a great majority in this land of ours, and they have bought into the culture of death that so characterizes the society that we live in today. There's no separation of the world and the ungodly. If, if you're in this meeting tonight, you might be on the clean side of the broad road, but God looks in and he sees what we can't see. And you're still, you're still numbered amongst those that are walking contrary to the way of the Lord. The blessed man's separation is also that he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. His, his company is not that of the world. Rather, he seeks out the company of the redeemed and, and he delights in the company of the people of God. Uh, the ungodly are not so. They stand in the way of sinners. That's what it means. Uh, they, they, they delight in the way of sinners. They, they have no problem in what sinners do. The blessed man's separation means he doesn't sit with the scorner. Those who mock the gospel, those who mock the things of God. I don't believe those who scorn the gospel, those who mock the gospel, are fit company for those who believe the gospel. And if that's your friendship group, unless you're making friends with them to win them for the Lord, you better look at your friendship group once again. I, I would challenge you on that one. The ungodly, they love the company of those who make a mock of sin. When the name of Jesus is derided, they laugh at it. When his name is scorned, they smile at it. It's only harmless fun. Anything can be said today about Christianity in the public square. Anything. But if a Christian gets up in the public square and dares to oppose the, the, the sins of the age, that Christian today is likely to be arrested. Verse 2 tells us something about the will of the blessed man. His delight is in the law of God. The desire, the delight of his heart is, is in the will of God, in the law of God. And of course, men are not born with such desires. They need to be born again for those desires to be put in their heart and to be put in their life. But the ungodly are not so. There's a stark contrast here. If the godly delight in the will of God, the ungodly certainly don't delight in the will of God. Why? Because Jesus told us, Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witness and blasphemies. Now, if you've never been born again of the Spirit of God, if you're still unrenewed in your heart and life, you've never known that quickening, regenerating power of the Spirit of God in your life, well, then this is your bent. This is your inclination, even this evening. Verse 2 tells us uh, about the word upon which the godly meditate. In his law do they meditate day and night. The law of the Lord is just another term for the word of the Lord. And this blessed man knew that if he was to prosper, he had to meditate upon the law of God. He had to meditate upon the truth of God. He had to ponder, he had to study, he had to apply what he read in the Word of God and then live it out. Live it out. The way of the ungodly stands in stark contrast. They have no regard for what the Bible says to them. They have no regard for what the Word of God says to their lives. They have utter, utterly rejected it. I was thinking of Moses when he went before Pharaoh. And remember, he's going before the leader of the, the world, the one world superpower of his day. And Moses went with the word of God and he went with that claim of God upon his people. And he said to Pharaoh, uh, Jehovah sent me and, and the word is, let my people go. And what did Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And isn't that the attitude of the world still today? You open the Bible, you preach the word of God. And even in pulpits, men and women, when the word of God is opened week by week, there are hearts that say, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Is that where you are tonight? You know, it's hard to believe in a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church that we have such in the gathering. But the Lord says what we can't say. The way of the ungodly, it, it stands in stark contrast 
to the way of the godly. Verse 3 reminds us about the works of the godly. I love this because it's pictured here as one of fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. The blessed man is likened unto one who is a, a tree that's been transplanted and put by the rivers of water. And in his season, he bears fruit. In his season, he bears fruit. Now, there's a season for fruitfulness in all of our lives. There's a season for growth. There's a season for spreading the branches. There's a season for putting the roots down. But I thank God also in the life of every Christian, there's a season for fruitfulness. And it's the same in the church. The, the Lord Jesus made mention of that in John 15, 5 and 16. He said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. How we thank God for fruit. We thank God for spiritual fruit, evidences of grace in the hearts and lives of the people of God. If you want to know what that fruit is, we'll not go there, but you can go there. Galatians chapter 5, 22, 23, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Here's the evidence. Where is it in your life? The love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, etc. Where is it? Regardless of the fact that you're found in the house of the Lord this evening, if there is no spiritual fruit in your life, there's no evidence that you're in verse 1 to 3. Uh, and I fear that there are many who sit in gospel pews such as you are sitting in this evening. Uh, and they're in the church, but they're not in Christ. There's no fruit in their life. At the end of another season, where is the spiritual fruit, my dear friend, in your life that tells me that you're numbered amongst the ungodly? Secondly, let's learn from this spiritual comparison that is made of the ungodly. Verse 4, they're likened unto the chaff which the wind driveth away. The chaff, of course, is the outside husk of the kernel of grain that was left after the threshing. I was in uh, the garden at the manse just uh, a few days ago. I was doing the grass. That's my, my weekly chore. <clears throat> and a thresher come up the, the road. I had been at one of those exhibitions. And it just took me back years and years uh, to the threshing machines that used to be so common around the countryside. I remember them as a boy. What was the job of it? It was to separate the grain from the chaff. It was to separate that which was useful from that which was not useful. The chaff in uh, Psalm 1 and in the New Testament times, it was separated from the grain by a winnowing process. Now, if you read Isaiah 30, verse 24, Matthew 3, and uh, verse 12, it talks about a fan. You know what that fan was? It was like a, a, a fork. And this long big pitchfork, maybe we would have used here in days gone by, it was put into the grain and to the bundles and it was thrown up in the air. And of course the chaff was blown away in the winnowing process. There was always a, a flat place around the farm homestead. And this process was done in the evening when there would have been a breeze that would have, would have picked itself up. And then the, the grain, it was further winnowed. When all the rough was taken from it, it was further winnowed and it was stored away in large container jars for the season that lay ahead. Now, the Holy Ghost makes a wonderful comparison here. He says that the ungodly are like chaff. Now, that's not a comparison that we would use today. Would you dare go to an unconverted man or woman and say you're just chaff? You're just chaff. You're just that which is left over from the harvest, which is of no use to anyone. Chaff is unstable. It has no roots. It can't grow. It's no longer attached to anything of worth. It simply lies on the surface of the ground. And the godly, they're compared, we, we looked at that in verse 3, to trees planted by the river of water. They have deep roots. They have stability. But the ungodly are just like the chaff. They're just blown around from one quarter to the other quarter. Whatever influence is upon them at that time takes them that way. Whatever influence is on the next time takes them that way. And we, we see it so often in our society. One, say, 
person rises up and influences them and everybody dresses one way and maybe six months up the road somebody else comes, they dress another way. They're just like the chaff, blowing about from one direction to the other direction. But the child of God has roots. We read about those roots in Ephesians 3.17. It tells us there that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded by love. Remember what it says, the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff, but the Christian has roots. And where, where do those roots go? Deep into Christ. The roots of the Christian go into Christ. That's personal saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what prevents you and I from being blown around from every part and from every quarter? It's just this. Are we any better than anybody else? No, sir, we're absolutely not. It's just that we have roots. Saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The ungodly are said to be like chaff because it's unsubstantial. It's, it's a weightless husk. Just an empty husk. There's no substance with it. And that's just a life that's lived without the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no substance to it whatsoever. We look out at the frivolity of the world in which we live in. And, you know, to get someone to have a serious conversation with today, I think you'll go quite a few days without meeting that individual. Somebody wants to talk about the matters of the soul. Somebody wants to talk about the matters of eternity. We live in a frivolous age. We, we live in a superficial age. The time of the world is spent in following the world and the weighty matters of eternity have no place in their thought or in their mind. The ungodly are like the chaff because they're unproductive. The godly produce fruit, but the ungodly chaff is lifeless and is fruitless. You can gather up the chaff as we've often seen it been done. You can bag it, you can put it to the side, but it will never ever be of any use or it will never ever bear any fruit. And if you're unsaved, the Bible says that's exactly where you are. The Bible says you're dead, spiritually speaking. Here in the house of God, where the living Spirit of God is at work and in our midst, ministering through the word of the Lord this evening, but you're spiritually dead in trespasses and in sin. And just like the chaff, you cannot bring forth that spiritual fruit until God, until God comes to your life and until God puts his hand upon your life. You need to experience that wondrous work of the new birth. We often, I think we often fail to understand what that new birth really is. It's not something you or I can do. It's something that God does in the soul. Now tell me, has God done it in your soul? Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Because you're just like the chaff otherwise. And the end result will be the same. There's a third lesson we learn from this psalm. And it is the sentence of condemnation upon the ungodly. Verse 4 tells us, they await the day of their death. It says, therefore the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Here it's described under the image of the wind. You know, the chaff there, it's on the winnowing floor. It's thrown up into the air. Uh, nothing very much happens without that evening breeze blowing it away. But when that wind comes, it's suddenly taken away. Uh, and I want to tell you, men and women, that there's a chilling blast from eternity and it's going to come and it's going to blow upon you one day and it's just going to take you away. And, and we'll come to that place where you've lived all of your life and you'll be there no longer. And you'll go to that place that you worked in and you'll be there no longer. And that family in which you were so loved and revered and you'll be there no longer because that wind will just take you away. Just like the wind blowing on the winnowing floor. It'll just take the chaff away. Ah, oh, but where to? Verse 5 tells us that even... As death takes the chaff away, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. The courtroom of the judgment day will be a red. 
but the sinner has no standing place in it. He has nothing to plead, and he has no one to plead for him. And the loneliest place in all eternity will be to stand before a thrice holy God, and there's no advocate for you. There's no one to name your name. There's no one to stand up on your behalf because the ungodly will not stand in the judgment. To hear those awful words. Matthew 25, 41. Depart from me, ye cursed. Ye cursed. Those truths should sink down into your heart tonight. The wind from eternity is going to blow one day in your heart and in your life and is going to summon you to the judgment of Almighty God where you will not stand and give a defense other than stand to hear your sentence. Though this wind driveth away the chaff from the green, the, 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 green, uh, the chaff is eventually burnt up. John Brown, in his notes uh, on the metrical Psalms, he vividly portrays the scene. He says, The chaff is ready to be hurled by the storms of infinite wrath into the depths of hell as cast and condemned in the righteous judgment of God. Hell is one of the hardest doctrines in the Bible. Jesus opened up his ministry by ministering upon it. It was prophesied of him that he will come and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his sweet into the garner and he, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This was the prophetical tone that John announced concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. This does not fit well the, the, the concept of this Jesus that the world preaches today, but this is the words of Jesus from the Bible. He will come and he will gather in his sweet into his garner. He'll thoroughly purge the floor, the winnowing floor. Not at, not at one not one kernel of grain will be left on that floor. It will be gathered and garnered in. But the chaff will be set aside and burnt with unquenchable fire. I think of, Je of how Jesus talked about that fire. There are preachers today who don't believe in the fire of hell. In great fear and trembling, I do believe in the fire of hell. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 25, 41. He said then, uh, shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed. Those are the ones in verse 3 to 6 of Psalm 1. Into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. The eternal fires of hell, brethren and sisters, and we speak with, with solemn tone, are for the chaff. Fire that will never be put out. An eternity of suffering that has no ending. We rejoice at this harvest, Thanksgiving. We, we, I always love the, the harvest Thanksgiving services, but there's a solemn reminder here. There's a final day coming. There's a final harvest home coming. The judgment day in which God will sift it out for all eternity. The chaff from the wheat. The wheat will be gathered in garnered safely for all eternity, the chaff will be set aside for the burning for all eternity. Tell me, where are you tonight? Are you really the chaff? If you can see yourself as the chaff tonight, is it not time that you repented of your sin and sought the Lord for mercy and pardon? Do not allow another harvest, do not allow another Lord's day to go by without seeking the Lord and calling upon him for mercy and for pardon. In closing, there's a final lesson here in Psalm 1, and it's the foreshadowing of the blessed Saviour. For he alone can save the ungodly. Psalm 1, of course, is a prophetical overview of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one man who can really fit accurately Psalm 1. 
There's only one man who could walk as Psalm 1 really depicted, and he's the perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who's blessed from all eternity and forever eternity blessed. In Psalm 72, David prayed for his son Solomon, but he was thinking of his greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that great doxology, it's often sung, Psalm 72, 17 to 19, it says, His name shall endure forever, and his name shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Now the one whose name is blessed forevermore is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was holy, harmless, and undefiled. He alone it was who fulfilled all righteousness and satisfied the just demands of God's law for you and for me. When we were yet without strength, the Bible tells us, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We think of those great words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 concerning Christ, that he knew no sin, and yet he became sin for us. He became the sin offering for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a state. It's only God can turn the chaff into the wheat. It's only God can take an unregenerate heart, an unrepentant heart, and turn it over in you and make it in you and make it into something that is worthy of his glory and the praise of his great eternal name. There is salvation tonight. We're, we're glad another Sabbath day to proclaim the good news that God wants to be reconciled to man. That's the news of the gospel. And the gospel application of it is you need to be reconciled to him. And through faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be reconciled to him this evening. Don't close the Sabbath day as you've done maybe other Sabbath days. In verse 4 to 6 of Psalm 1, numbered amongst the chaff, close it the way God wants you to close it today. Verse 1 to 3, numbered amongst the godly, the wheat, those for whom he's coming back and those for whom he'll garner in to his great eternal garner for all eternity. May the Lord bless you this evening. Bless his word to all of our hearts and to all of our lives. Let's unite in prayer, please, as we close our meeting tonight. We sang that lovely old gospel hymn earlier on in the service. The Saviour will call thee in judgment before him, and he will. But it says, Oh, let all thy sins go and make him thy friend. Now yield him thy heart and make haste to adore him. Thy harvest is passing. Thy summer will end. The summer's already ended, men and women. The harvest is passing. Make haste tonight to Christ and make him your friend. I beseech you. Heavenly Father and eternal God, we thank thee for the opportunity to gather around the word of the Lord this evening. We thank thee for the lessons gleaned from Psalm 1. We know the ungodly are not so. And Lord, we've thought of the godly man's picture, but the ungodly are not so. They can mix with the wheat, but they are not wheat. The chaff will never be the wheat. And we pray that there might be a sifting, even in this meeting tonight, that thou wilt sift hearts out before the judgment bar of God, and that thou wouldst even enable sinners tonight to make haste to make Jesus their friend, that they will not let another summer end and harvest past and go on in their sin, rejecting Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. O Lord, as we draw this gospel net in tonight, we pray that souls might be gathered in it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear us, we beseech thee, and when the voice of man is silent, may the still, small voice of God's Spirit continue to speak on and strive on in our midst. Separate us now, one from the other, 
in thy fear and with thy favor and take us back to our homes in safety and out into the week ahead with the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, resting and abiding and remaining upon us, both now and evermore. Amen.